The UN warns that the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is growing more acute. In southern Gaza, a quarter of the population faces catastrophic levels of food insecurity. In northern Gaza, nearly one in three children are severely malnourished. Nick Schifrin speaks to the UN's top humanitarian official about Gaza, Sudan, and what he calls one of the worst years for humanitarian crises. The UN says every single one of Gaza's 2.2 million or so residents need food assistance, and the threat of famine is looming. One of the leading officials dealing with this crisis is the UN's Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, Martin Griffiths, who will be stepping down soon after a 50-year career on humanitarian and conflict work. Martin Griffiths, thanks so much. Thank Welcome you. back to the news hour. The executive director of the World Food Program, Cindy McCain, recently said that northern Gaza is in, quote, full-blown famine. Do you agree? I, I would agree with her in substance, in the sense that uh, there is a very, very, as you know, stringent technical process, independent of the UN, by the way, to identify when famine exists. But we know from Gaza, we know from elsewhere, that don't wait for the declaration of the official declaration to know that uh, people are dying of hunger, kids are dying of malnutrition. Today, the U.S. military announced that uh, a floating pier uh, designed to deliver humanitarian aid to Gaza has been attached to Gaza. They have hundreds of tons of aids ready for delivery, thousands more tons in the pipeline. How much of an impact could this kind of thing have? It's very helpful. Um, we've always said that uh, any way to get more aid in should be welcomed. We've also said, as you know, that land access routes tend to be more efficient and can go to scale. We in the UN and the World Food Program are uh, ready and prepared to help distribute that aid coming in off the floating pier in the days to come to Gaza. There are also security concerns about the pier. UN officials who've been working to prepare the pier had to take cover uh, when the area came under fire. Uh, how serious, from your perspective, are the security concerns uh, for the UN, for the World Food Program, who's going to be part of this? I think they're very serious. For the moment, the risk level is one that we can go with on the basis that no aid is coming in in the other areas. So we're looking at uh, being able to fulfill our task of distribution internally and hoping that we can get the right people to help us on the beach to get aid to the World Food Program. Who are those right people? Well, I think we're talking about contractors as well as maybe some uh, UN staff. That's we're in the final stages of making sure that we've we've got an operation that we are happy in terms of accountability as well as risk levels for anybody who's going to be there. There have been occasions where Hamas has diverted or stolen the aid. How do you prevent that from happening? Where that's happened, we have negotiated to get that aid back. And uh, as far as I'm aware, in all cases, that has succeeded. We need to get all deliveries safely delivered. Aid is going in through the north, as you know, Nick, through Eretz. I think 54 trucks got in there yesterday. An Erez crossing in the north recently opened by Israel. Recently opened. Most welcome, by the way. But on the whole, that aid is going to the needs, which are very extensive in the north. Getting aid into the south is incredibly difficult because both of the main crossing points are closed uh, or difficult to get through. Since the Israeli military launched an operation on the ground into Rafah, uh, specifically at the border crossing between Rafah and Egypt, that border has been closed. Israel blames Egypt for blocking aid. Egypt blames the Israeli military operation for destabilizing the border. Why do you think uh, not enough aid is getting through that border? Because it's closed and because Keresh Shalom, the other border crossing, is also a place of great difficulty to get any trucks in. Added to that, Nick, of course, is the fact that without fuel inside, it doesn't matter. You can't move. You can't move the trucks. Our stocks inside southern Gaza of food and other uh, items are more or less done, finished. We know that there are no more tents yet for people to go to. There's 600,000 people have moved in the last uh, couple of weeks. We know that medical supplies may have three weeks. We know that food in the market is about to run. There's no good news about what's happening in Rafa. As you know, the Israeli government has remained concerned about Hamas infiltration. Um, and the Israeli military this week said that drone footage shows armed men standing next to U.N. vehicles at a U.N. compound. 
in Rafa. How does this happen, uh, and and what can the UN do to prevent it? Well, I think UNRWA has reacted to that report and is looking into the factual basis. So when did this happen? Uh, where did this happen? How did this happen if it did? So until we've got the facts, I'm not going to comment. After Israeli missiles killed seven World Central Kitchen workers, uh, Israel said that it would improve coordination uh, with humanitarian organization, including by opening up a new coordination center. Has Israel done enough to answer the concerns of the UN, the US, and international organizations, especially since that incident? I've just been learning of some uh, promises of progress on that very issue of uh, embedding uh, a UN staff member from my own office, indeed, with Southern Command to make sure that we are clearly aware of the trajectory of the conflict and are able to uh, guide our humanitarian operations accordingly. And I just hope this is going to work. Let me move you to Sudan, uh, which is the world's largest displacement crisis, uh, one of the world's largest food crises. Yesterday, the UN Special Envoy to Sudan said the Sudanese people uh, were trapped in, quote, an inferno of brutal violence. Can famine in Sudan be prevented? Yes, but will it be prevented? I don't know. Five million people at risk of famine. I'm not aware of that number ever having been at that level of risk. We need the militaries of both sides, of all sides, to give us access, to get our convoys through, to get our aid through to the people. It's the trajectory of the war and the commanders on the ground who are not giving us the access that we need. And finally, Martin Griffiths, if I may uh, take a moment to step back. We haven't even talked about Afghanistan, uh, Ukraine, Yemen. I wonder uh, how you look at this year and this moment after, as I said at the top, uh, a nearly 50-year career focused on humanitarian and conflict aid. Well, I do think it's as bad as it's ever been. And I think it's a year of broken promises, Nick. The promises that the world's leaders made these recent decades, these promises are left at the entrance and parked there. But we still have across cultures, across communities, across the world, and I see it in my work, the depth of humanity of ordinary people, which has not changed. There's no change in these essential values. What there is a change in is the leadership that we suffer from, I'm afraid, which don't listen to these straightforward pleas, which all of us, all of us believe in. We all want a better future for our children and our families right across the world. Martin Griffiths. Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Appreciate it.